Great. Thank you, Evan. Welcome, everybody. My name is Margaret Lloyd. I'm the Small Farms Advisor for UC Cooperative Extension, and I cover Yellow Salon on Sacramento County. And uh, we're at an exciting time in farming and science when we've really come to acknowledge the role of microbes. And with our scientific tools, we're able to better understand them. And among all those microbes that live in our soil, some of them form a close relationship with plants, a symbiotic relationship. So that brings us here today to talk about mycorrhizal fungi. And today's talk is really inspired by the needs and interests of farmers, of you all, who are interested in harnessing the power and potential of these microbes. So today we have um, Tim Bowles, who is Assistant Professor of Agroecology at the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. We have Janina Dirk, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Berkeley Agroecology Lab. And we have Yvonne Sokolar, who's a PhD candidate in the Berkeley Agroecology Lab. Uh, they've spent the last uh, several years and beyond uh, working on mycorrhizal fungi, so they'll be uh, sharing their research. Go ahead, Tim. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, really excited to talk mycorrhizae. It's something we love to nerd out about. Um, and I know it's uh, probably been on some of your minds. Um, so uh, to get us started, um, I was going to just kind of take a little poll. Um, if you are uh, willing, you know, I think mycorrhizae evoke a lot of things like um, kind of mysterious, but also they're these like star players in our soils. Um, so what comes to mind when you um, hear the word mycorrhizae? Um, if you see at the top of your screen, um, if you go, if you're on your phone, you're on a computer, tablet, whatever, you can go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com and then enter the little code up there. Um, and share a word or two or three, a phrase maybe that um, comes to mind when you hear the word mycorrhizae. Um, yeah, what does it evoke for you? Give you all just a second, hopefully to share some, share some thoughts. They, in theory, should start appearing on our screen here. Yeah, here, let me send out the link in the chat here and the number in case it, ah, here we go. Yeah, nice. Connection, collaboration. I love how that's coming out at the top here. Kind of symbiosis, this idea that like an interaction between two things can yield positive benefits. Man, what if we, thought about that in our geopolitics these days, right? Um, communication, underground soil life, health, nutrients, transport. Yeah, to give it another 15 or 20 seconds here. This is awesome. Forest communication, right? There's been a lot, I think, um, some popular literature and just some stories, right, about how interconnected uh, trees are in a forest communicating through these mycorrhizal networks. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna, this is great. And symbiosis kind of remains at the center of it all. And, and that's really is at the heart of what we are talking about, right? This um, amazing interaction between plants and these fungi that have evolved over literally hundreds of millions of years. And so um, today we're going to talk about a lot of this. We're going to start with um, just trying to get us all on the same page about some of the biology and the ecology of what these are. Because if we can begin to understand that biology and that ecology, we can begin to really think through um, the way that we farm and how our different farming practices likely impact mycorrhizae and how we might be able to help steward them um, to help them um, provide the benefits that, that we hope to get. Um, but also maybe think of some times when um, our management isn't doing such a good job um, and, and might actually lead to, to some of the breakdown in that symbiosis. So this is wonderful. Um, clearly a lot of inspiring things here, right? Uh, thinking about this potential for connection and symbiosis. 
uh, something, like I said, that we need a lot more of in our lives these days. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next uh, uh, slide here, if I can. All right, it's kind of, sorry, it's uh, not advancing for me. Sorry, just a second. Oh, there it goes, one too fast. Okay, so we're gonna start, like I said, by just asking um, what are uh, mycorrhizal fungi and what do they do? So let's start out, I think, with just a, an incredible image, this microscopic image of the namesake of this particular type of mycorrhizae that we're talking about today are buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Wow, that is a mouthful, I know. What do we mean by arbuscule? Well, think about if, if you are a Spanish speaker or uh, think about the word arbol, right? It means tree. And this structure here that you see, this is the fungal structure that forms inside of a plant root. And obviously, right, it looks like a tree. So this is where, this is the namesake of our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. This particular type of mycorrhizae, it has a lot of different mycorrhizal species, but this is the type of mycorrhizae that form associations with all of the, with most all of the major crops that we grow. There are some different types of mycorrhizae that form associations um, with, with uh, trees in particular, but like even the trees that we typically use as crops, like anything in the prunus uh, genus is forming associations with arbuscular mycorrhizae. And so this structure here is really critical for that symbiosis, that connection that you all mentioned. So I wanna talk a little bit about what is happening at this interface between uh, this fungus and, and the root. So let's move on to here. So. On the left-hand side, imagine this is like zooming in on a plant root, okay? And each of these little boxes is a cell in the plant root. And you can see this middle part over here, this would be the xylem, that those like transport vessels that bring water um, and nutrients up into the leaves. And here, this picture is like, a little picture of a spore of a mycorrhizal fungi hanging out in the soil. And when conditions are right, that spore starts to germinate and it produces what are called hyphae, which are little strands that run through the soil and they actually get inside the plant root and then they um, start to form these little arbuscules, these little structures uh, where they're exchanging um, energy and nutrients with the plant. And then eventually, they also send out hyphae back out into the soil where they take up things like uh, phosphorus and other nutrients, and then they also reproduce and they, and they produce more spores. So we're gonna talk just a little bit more about this exchange that's happening here, right? This is really about um, uh, helping uh, 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 each, organism involved here do something better, right? The interaction between the plant and the fungus has been going on for hundreds of millions of years, ever since plants actually moved out of the water and out of the oceans and onto land. Okay, so you can imagine a plant hanging out in the ocean. It's got all these nutrients swirling around in the water. It doesn't need a lot of roots, but then it moves onto land and it's in soil, and those nutrients aren't nearly as available. Well, this fungus actually helped to evolve, evolve to help the plants access nutrients in the soil that would otherwise be less available. And in return, the plant does what it does best. It photosynthesizes. It creates sugars, which are carbon, and it sends, those, it sends that uh, carbon down into its roots and then eventually out um, into uh, uh, the mycorrhizae. So what's happening here is that the mycorrhizal fungi with the ex extensive network of hyphae are taking up nutrients from the soil. They're transporting those through their hyphae, through these little strands into the uh, arbuscules that exist in the uh, plant roots. And they're trading those nutrients for carbon, for sugars from the plant. 
And ultimately what happens is this can really increase the efficiency with which roots can absorb, particularly the really immobile nutrients in soil, things like phosphorus and zinc, but also things that have some more mobility like forms of nitrogen. And of course, they are also doing more than just um, increasing nutrient uptake. We're gonna talk in just a few minutes how they might be involved in helping plants deal with water stress. So this is a picture of what these actually look like. Now, these uh, images, these are uh, images from a microscope and they've actually been stained with a particular type of stain that binds to those fungal structures so that we can see them. If we tried to look at a root without this type of stain, even if we had a microscope, we really wouldn't be able to see these very well. Um, and you can see here, this is a root structure. Uh, these happen to be corn roots, but, um, and then you can see these strands that are in the dark blue here. These are the hyphal strands that are um, coming into that root. Um, they're forming these um, arbuscules here. Um, and then eventually they're also uh, reproducing and forming spores. So I wanted to share just some stats on comparing hyphae versus roots, right? Because this I think is really illuminating to me about why would a plant decide to form this relationship with this whole other organism, this whole other domain of life in the soil? Um, well, let's look at just the diameter of hyphae versus roots. Hyphae are very, very small, between two and 10 microns in diameter. And just for kind of reference sake, your hair, you know, depending on your hair might vary between 60 and 200 microns thick. So a hyphal strand is like 10 or 100 times smaller in diameter than your hair, something you really couldn't see with your naked eye. Roots, on the other hand, are over tend to be much, much bigger. I've got a little cartoon image down here that's roughly like the relative size, if we scaled this up, of an AMF hyphal strand and a root, right? They're much smaller than this, but relatively speaking, this is a good comparison. Now, another stat here, this is called the specific length. This is the meters of hyphae or roots per gram of soil, right? A gram of soil is about a teaspoon. So, uh, Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi can form hyphae, meters of hyphae in a teaspoon of soil versus roots that might have a tiny fraction of that. And the other thing that they do is they really expand the access that plants have to the volume of soil around them. So the radius of influence of hyphae um, from uh, 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 kind of a, uh, the, cent the, the central kind of root system of a plant can extend 25 centimeters versus maybe less than one centimeter for a root accessing nutrients. So you can start to imagine why um, hyphae are so good at going out into the little teensy tiny pore spaces in soil inside the little teensy tiny aggregates um, where there's organic matter and where there's nutrients and really taking that up and bringing it back to the plant. All right, so we've talked a little bit just about, um, you know, about what do, they, what do they do, a little bit about how they've evolved. Now I wanna talk about um, how does agriculture just generally speaking um, affect uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So, and I wanna start with just a little bit more on their biology, because I think this is one of the most crucial points in understanding um, how farming influences them. Our muscular mycorrhizae are different from most other organisms on earth. That's because they're what's called an obligate biotroph. Now that means that they cannot reproduce on their own. They have to have living roots in order to complete their life cycle and produce spores. They are not like other types of fungi, including those that form mushrooms. Um, you know, mycorrhizae, our muscular mycorrhizae don't form mushrooms. Other types do, but our muscular mycorrhizae can't decompose organic matter in the soil. They actually get all of their energy from living roots. So this is really crucial to remember. 
They also can sort of, um, uh, their inoculum or what they use to um, form associations with new roots can, can come from three different sources. The spores that they produce, and here are just some really pretty pictures of all different types of spores that different species of arbuscular mycorrhizae produce, also very small. Also, they can also, another source of inoculum that it is, is root fragments in the soil that have some um, AMF still living in them, but also that intact hyphal network, right? That some of you mentioned when we, um, at the beginning. Um, if a new plant, if a seed starts growing where there's a new hyphal network, that hyphal network can end up um, uh, forming associations with the roots that are formed. Okay, but we know that just agriculture, generally speaking, like the conversion of a natural ecosystem into an agricultural ecosystem has some big changes associated with it. Um, and so I'm just, I wanna show here just some results of kind of an old but classic study. And what it's looking at is the number of AMF spores in the soil. That's what's on, that's what these bars are showing. And they're showing it in three types of ecosystems in kind of grassland soils. So soils that don't disturb a lot of experience, they still have, um, at least in this case, this was still a native plant community. But then in um, agricultural systems that have been monocropped, and then agricultural systems that have, have had more crop rotation. And you can see that as you convert just from a grassland into these more cropping systems, you see a huge reduction in the number of AMF spores but you also see a difference between these monocropping systems and crop rotation. So just generally speaking with agriculture, when we remove native vegetation, when we have long fallow periods, disturb the soil, use fungicide, grow monocultures, um, all of these things reduce the abundance and diversity of mycorrhizae. So we can also think about this then in the kind of inverse. Okay, what agricultural practices then can be used to promote um, AMF. And so <clears throat> that's what I want to show here is the results uh, from what's called a, a meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is when we look at a whole bunch of studies that have been done all over the world on different, and in this case, what we're looking at is two things, cover cropping and reduced or no tillage, and how that affect the percentage of, our, of mycorrhizae that have formed associations in roots. So this is, when we looked at that image of AMF earlier that, was, that had the stain on it, we can actually count how many um, AMF that we see in a stained root and get a measure of the percent of that root um, that has formed associations. And that's what we're showing on this y-axis. So what I did um, is I looked at studies from all over the world and compared cover cropping versus bare fallow and asked what effect does cover cropping have on AMF colonization of the cash crops that followed. And what we see is that cover cropping increased the so-called colonization of the cash crop roots by 30%. That's a lot. Now, when we looked at reduced versus conventional tillage, we also saw almost the same kind of change that reduced tillage increased the colonization of roots by AMF by about 30%. And then we could also look at these two things together. Reduced tillage without cover crops uh, versus conventional tillage was about 25% um, higher. And then we get a little bit of an additive effect here. When we combine reduced tillage with cover cropping, we get almost a 40% increase relative to uh, bare fallow with conventional tillage. So let's just remember AMF require living roots to reproduce. So you can imagine why a cover crop is so important here because we're growing living roots in a time of year when there otherwise wouldn't be much happening. And then the second part that 
new plants can form associations with AMF and also through that intact hyphal network. So when we're doing a lot of tillage, we're disrupting that, that hyphal network that would otherwise be intact. But I think some good news, um, particularly for um, California, and we know that reducing tillage in a lot of our organic vegetable systems can be really tricky, um, that cover cropping does seem to be an effective way to increase AMF abundance even when there's tillage happening. And so we'll come back to that point um, in a few minutes. All right. Now, I'm gonna have this kind of last section here before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, and I wanna just share a little bit about what AMF do specifically in California vegetable systems. And then ask this question is, are they always friendly? Um, so the first question about what they do, I just wanna share one study um, that I did a number of years ago um, in Davis. Um, this was at uh, the student farm, an organically managed farm in Davis where I did a small trial um, with uh, a paste type tomato. And normally studying the effects of mycorrhizae in real agricultural systems is really tricky because how do you figure out, well, what the mycorrhizae are doing? You, it's, you can't, it's, not, it's not very effective or a very good idea to come in and say, well, maybe I should apply a fungicide and kill all the mycorrhizae and then plant, you know, compare my uh, a place where I didn't do that or a place where I killed all the AMF. That doesn't seem like a great idea. So normally this is a really hard thing to study to figure out what mycorrhizae are doing in the field, so to speak, right? Not in just a greenhouse study. But we have a, a really cool um, system that we can use where we have kind of a normal paste tomato and then a really strange variety that was actually bred for research purposes that forms greatly reduced associations with mycorrhizae. And so that's what I mean by this AM and non-AM here on this picture, arbuscular mycorrhizal and non arbuscular mycorrhizal tomatoes. And so when we plant these side by side, we can kind of look at the differences between them and how um, they perform to kind of get a sense of what are mycorrhizae doing out there. And so we grew these two types of tomatoes. We had 100% irrigation, that is kind of replacing all of the evapotranspiration. And then we had a 50% deficit irrigation. So kind of stressing these quite out, uh, plants out quite a bit. And then we just looked at, we looked at a number of things, but all I wanna show here is the, um, the crop yield, the yield of the tomatoes per unit of water applied. And what we see is about a 25% yield increase, both under 100% irrigation and 50% irrigation when we had AMF um, associated with these tomatoes or not. So it seems like AMF are playing a big role here. Um, both under these non-water stressed and water stressed conditions um, and helping these plants produce uh, more tomatoes uh, per drop of water applied. But what can we do to actually kind of boost um, their, their benefits? So that was the next question that we had. And so this case study actually utilized a long-term experiment on also in Davis. And this was some work done by Franz Bender, um, who was in my lab a few years ago. And this long-term experiment compared a few different types of cropping systems over 25 years. So there were four different um, cropping systems that are, we're gonna talk about. They all grow uh, processing tomatoes. Um, there's an organically managed system here on the bottom. It's a corn tomato rotation that has uh, winter cover crops um, uses composted poultry manure for fertilization and um, any or all organic plant protection. And then there are three different types of conventional systems. Um, a low input system that has winter cover crops and reduced synthetic fertilizer, a conventional system that with no cover crops and synthetic fertilizer, and then a system that has um, a long alfalfa rotation 
um, also uses winter cover crops, but then the tomatoes and the corn receive fertilizer and conventional plant protection. And so our hypothesis going into this was, well, we should see the biggest benefits of mycorrhizae in the organic system, right? There's no fungicides being applied. You're growing winter cover crops. So we know that that can increase AMF abundance. And nutrients are sometimes more limiting in, in organic systems where we're not using synthetic fertilizers. And so we used these same tomatoes that I talked about last time where we have a non-mycorrhizal and a mycorrhizal tomato and we just planted them across these four types of farming systems and asked, well, how do these, what, is the, what, are, what are mycorrhizae doing after 25 years of different management? And honestly, the results were really surprising. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of a, a complex graph here that I wanna just talk through a little bit. On all of them, this is showing tomato yields per plant. And then in the, we have the four different systems, the alfalfa rotation on the left, the conventional tomato, the low input tomato and the organic tomato system. And what we see in the darker bars are the, the wild type or the regular paste type tomato. And then in the light bars, we have the other type of tomato that has this non or reduced mycorrhizal colonization. So the difference between these two is really looking at the effect of mycorrhizae. And what really surprised us here is that actually in the organic system, the mycorrhizae didn't seem to be providing much of a benefit, at least in terms of yield. Whereas in this system that had a long alfalfa rotation, but did use some, some synthetic fertilizers, they appeared to be providing a lot of benefit. Now, this is not to suggest that synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and that kind of thing are positive for AMF. We know that they're usually not. So what's going on here? Well, this got to um, kind of a subtle effect um, that uh, really brings up this more complex issue that we don't really talk about a lot with mycorrhizae. We always think of them as a symbiosis, a mutualist. That is the mutualism is providing benefits for both the plant and the fungus. But that's not always the case. Sometimes they might be acting the, mic, the fungi might be acting more in a neutral kind of way or even acting more almost like a parasite. When they act more like a parasite, that means that the costs to the plant are outweighing the benefits that they get from the fungi. So by costs, I mean how much carbon or energy or sugars that the plant has to give the fungi versus the benefits that they receive in terms of the nutrients that they take up which may or may not increase plant growth. And so if the benefits to the plant outweigh the costs, then we think of this as a mutualism. But if, these, if the benefits and costs are pretty even, though well, that's kind of what we saw in this, um, uh, in this organic system right here, right? The, it didn't really seem to make much of a difference whether it was mycorrhizal. And then if we had actually seen negative growth, in the mycorrhizal tomatoes, that would have been more of a parasitism when the costs actually outweigh the benefits. So what's going on here? This was a big question for us. And we don't know definitively what's going on, but we at least have an idea. So if you look at the levels of phosphorus in the soil across these four systems, we at least get a clue. This, is, this graph is showing the amount of available phosphorus as Olson P. And what we, all of these levels of phosphorus would be considered sufficient for tomatoes. But what we see is, is a fair bit higher phosphorus levels in the organic system. And if you recall, this was um, used a lot of uh, poultry manure, right? That has a relatively low nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. This led to some phosphorus buildup over time. And what we know is that when plants have a lot of phosphorus available, then mycorrhizae 
aren't as useful and that they can actually start to become more of a cost. And so this is what's called a fertilizer induced parasitism. Um, and again, we didn't see actual parasitism here. We just saw sort of a neutral effect, but we might've seen that going towards parasitism if these phosphorus levels had been much, much higher. So just to kind of sum up, this organic system that receives this composted manure has a lot, this composted manure has a lot more phosphorus relative to nitrogen than plants need and it led to this phosphorus buildup in soil, which in turn seemed to reduce the benefits that these plants are getting from AMF. So I know this is um, kind of a complex story here, but I think it's something important that we keep in mind as part of this whole picture when we think about how we steward mycorrhizae. Um, I know this was a lot. We covered a lot of ground, biology, ecology, evolution, agriculture. Um, and so, um, and we're gonna have plenty of time at the end for, for questions and, and discussion, um, but we're gonna shift gears a little bit um, and start to think about another tool um, that I haven't talked about yet which is um, actually using commercial AMF inoculants. Um, and so I'm curious, um, let's see if this shows up here. So there we go. Um, I have another question for you, if you'd be willing to go back to um, the, uh, the Menti site. Um, so I'm curious if folks have ever tried commercial AMF inoculants, so actually purchasing AMF inoculants, um, if you found it to be useful, if you've tried it before and found it not to be useful, if you're interested but you've never tried it, or you've never tried it and are not interested. I'll give just a... A little bit more time here for folks to get responses in. Looks like a in, nice. I would love, yeah, and, and love to hear. And this would definitely be an opportunity for conversation, folks sharing some experiences in a, in a few minutes. It um, seems like there's been a wide, at least some folks who have tried it before found it to be useful. Um, Let's see, let me say no poll showed up. If you just have to go to this same site and then I'm, the one that I just put in the chat and then I can't see the number very well, let's see. Um, you just put in this number right here. I think it's that and then you'll be able to answer. All right. Well, it looks like we have the largest pool of folks who have never tried it but are interested. Um, and then a few folks who have tried it before and found it to be useful. And again, I'd love to hear people's experiences um, after we kind of wrap up the talking at you part of this uh, uh, presentation and, and have more of a conversation. All right. Okay, well, I'm gonna pass it over now to um, Yanina, um, who's gonna talk about some of the research um, that we've done with um, commercial inoculants. And I think it'll just take a second for the slide to switch again, Yanina. It's kind of slow. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's exciting to be talking in front of such a large audience. So yeah, I will share with you some of the AMF research that we've conducted over the last two years specifically focusing on using commercial AMF inoculum. And as Tim mentioned, um, there's some ev evidence that intensive agriculture management may negatively affect the resident AMF in the soil. And to this end, I wanted to bring up this figure again that you've just seen a few minutes ago, because it really nicely shows how AMF spore abundance is much larger in grassland soils compared to in agricultural soils. But at the same time, studies suggest that AMF can improve crop yields and crop tolerance to stress. 
And so there is a reason behind the idea of amending soils that have been intensely managed with commercial AMF inoculum. And it is a topic that has gained increasing interest. But we don't truly know yet the potential of introduced AMF to successfully, successfully become established and effectively increase crop yields and crop tolerance to stress. Uh, next slide. So in 2021, uh, no, sorry, in 2020, we conducted a on-farm field experiment in which we tested the effect of inoculating tomato seedlings with commercial AMF on marketable yields. And we added a 50% deficit irrigation treatment to assess whether inoculation would have a greater impact on yield when plants are water stressed. And the figure visualizes the experimental layout. So there were six replicates or six blocks, each of which included both the irrigation and inoculation treatments. Okay, next slide. So here are some of the results. In this figure, you see on the x-axis, the different irrigation treatments, um, full irrigation versus deficit irrigation. And on the y-axis, the marketable yield. And in this case, it's on a per plant basis. And then the yellow box plots, box plots represent the inoculated plants and the green, the non-inoculated plants. And the, the results show that inoculation under full irrigation actually decreased yields by 34%. On the contrary, under deficit irrigation, inoculation increased yields by 14%. The first finding specifically was unexpected. And to see whether this result could be extrapolated to a larger scale, in 2021, we assessed the effect of AMF inoculation on tom tomato yields across 20 different fields. So in this experiment, all fields were fully irrigated and we included six different soil management practices, which I will specify in a minute. Again, the figure visualizes the experimental layout. Per field, we had paired inoculated versus non-inoculated plots, each being replicated three times. And for all but two of the soil management practices, there were four fields per practice. Here, some results in the figure on the x-axis, you see the different fields. On the y-axis, you see the difference in marketable yield between the inoculated versus the non-inoculated plots. So each data point above the line represents plots where inoculation had a positive effect, and each data point below the line represents um, fields, plots where inoculation had a negative effect. And the circles represent fields that were under drip irrigation, the triangles fields that were under furrow irrigation. And then the different colors represent the different soil management practices or the different types of organic matter that were added to the field. So we had a grapevine green waste that was applied in the fall, then a mixed green waste that was applied in the fall, two organic matter, uh, two, two treatments where no organic matter was added, one under drip and one under furrow irrigation, and then two organic treatments where poultry manure was added in the spring for both of them, and then one had a cover crop in the winter and the other one had a green waste applied the previous fall. So as you can see, the dots are basically everywhere above and below the line, and there's no clear effect of inoculation on marketable yields. <clears throat> 
The figures for fruit quality, bricks, pH, hue, look very similar to this figure. And st statistically, there was no difference between inoculated and non-inoculated plants. So yield, fruit quality, yield and fruit quality were not affected by inoculation, regardless of soil management practice. Okay, next slide. So then briefly to touch upon potential reasons, we don't know the reason, but it could be that the plants in these fields are sufficiently well supplied with nutrients and therefore AMF just may not matter. And that is kind of what Tim was mentioning earlier in this figure where in fertilized soils, the benefits of AMF may just not be very strong if at all present. Or alternatively, the resident AMF community in the soil may be very well functioning and introducing AMF may just not have a may just not have an additional beneficial effect. And or the introduced AMF did not become successfully established and as a result of that did not have a beneficial effect on yields. With that, I pass on to Yvonne. Great, thanks Yanina. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So going back to that really cool result that we got from the summer of 2020, um, Yanina was just talking about um, under these fully watered conditions, trying to look into the decrease yields that we found from inoculation for from summer 2020. And as we dug further into that, it seemed like there actually wasn't much of an effect um, from inoculation either way. And I've been doing research uh, again in the summer of 2021 about the water stress side of the story. So um, in summer 2020, we looked at a 50% deficit irrigation and there are actually um, systems in California that go beyond that 50% deficit and use really, really reduced water. Um, and thanks, Tim. Um, these are dry farm tomato systems and they are um, sort of a, a way to look into this water stress question in a, a system that is actually currently practicing these um, deficit irrigation systems. Um, so a real world application when AMF might be really beneficial in helping plants relieve water stress. Um, and if anyone is curious to talk more about how and why AMF might relieve water stress, we can definitely chat about that in the Q&A later. So these dry farm systems use one to two irrigation events over the course of the whole season. And they do that by um, trying to improve the soil water holding capacity on the fields where they're grown in order to really capitalize here in California, we have a Mediterranean climate, which means that it rains a lot over the winter and then doesn't rain at all over the summer. But if there are ways to capture that winter rain in a soil water bank, you can then use that to um, hopefully get your plants through the summer. And there are reasons why tomatoes specifically um, are really an ideal crop for doing this. They don't um, necessarily try this with any old crop you have lying around, but tomatoes and maybe a couple other ones um, are pretty drought tolerant to begin with and are able to take that water from winter rains and last the entire summer off of just what was already in the ground. Um, the farms that I was working with sort of cheat that a little bit. They might have one to two irrigation events at the beginning of the season, um, but really extremely reduced irrigation compared to the farms that we were looking at earlier. Um, and like I was saying before, there's a suite of management practices that are used in order to try to really capitalize on those winter rains um, and make sure that tomatoes are able to thrive over the course of the summer. So climate is a huge part of this um, and you need to be growing in a place that doesn't get too hot um, and it's helpful to have the um, sort of humidity in the air. So the marine influence that we get on the coast here in California, the farms that I was working with are on the central coast. So it's cooler temperatures compared to the processing tomatoes that you'll see grown in the Central Valley um, and also just wetter um, in the air. It still isn't actually raining though. And then the soil itself 
is a large contributor there as well. Having an increased clay content can really help water hold onto soil if you, or <laughs> soil hold onto water. If you imagine um, like a sand and pour water on it, it'll just all sort of fall out the bottom pretty quickly. Whereas a clay can really hold that water in place uh, until the plant roots are able to get down and start to access it. Um, and then there's actual active management that you can do as well. So um, having a cover crop can help to increase the soil organic matter and also um, is interesting you know, talking about AMF. It's a way to really promote the um, native AMF community in your soil before starting to plant. Um, there are things called dust mulches that farmers do, which is actually a form of tillage that breaks the top six inches or so of the soil to try to break capillaries at the, at the very top of the soil that would otherwise allow water to move up more easily and evaporate. Um, and farmers try to deliver nutrients down deeper into the soil, um, which also involves pretty extensive tillage. Um, because ideally these roots are getting down deep really quickly to be able to access water um, that is deeper down in the soil. So having a lot of nutrients at the surface doesn't help, but having them down at depth where the plant roots are is ideally gonna be the place where the plants will be able to find those nutrients. Um, so it's sort of an interesting combination thinking back to what Tim was talking about earlier with cover crops potentially being helpful, but tillage potentially being harmful in terms of resident AMS communities. And this system has a lot of both that it really relies on um, to make these dry farm systems work. Um, we can go to the next slide. So in order to um, start to ask these questions about whether inoculation can be helpful in these really low water environments, I set up an experiment um, and got funding from Western SARE to do this to inoculate um, plots on seven different dry farm tomato fields. And it was similar to what Yanina was talking about already. Um, you can see these um, plots were all paired. So one would be inoculated, one would be non-inoculated. Um, and there were 10 plots total on each field. So 70 plots across all the seven different farms that I was looking at. Um, and you can see a picture here of what the actual inoculation looked like. Um, and I think there might be some questions later on about inoculation delivery methods that I would be happy to talk about with anyone who's curious. But in this case, we were mixing the inoculant in with water and then delivering that right at the base of the plant. Um, we can go to the next slide. So it turns out, like Yanina also found, that there was absolutely no difference whatsoever um, if you uh, sort of agglomerate all of the data, there was no difference in yields between control and inoculated plants. Um, also, I think I forgot to mention before, these are fresh market tomatoes as opposed to processing tomatoes, but um, still tomatoes. And um, also, if you go to the next slide, we can see that there also wasn't any difference um, if you look at a field level. So each of um, the pairs of bars here come from a different field. And on any given field, there was not an effect of inoculation. So just across the board, um, on all these seven dry farm fields, we saw no benefit or harm coming from inoculating the, the crops here. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So in terms of why we were seeing this happening, um, my guess is that it's probably this middle reason here. Um, this is the same slide that Yanina was talking about before. So in this case, though there is a sufficient nutrient supply, um, you can sort of think of water almost as a nutrient in this case, and that it's an input that is really important to these plants' survival, and plants don't have enough of it, and we know that AMF is helpful in helping plants tolerate this stress. So there wasn't really a sufficient supply of water, and we knew that these plants were stressed, so that seems like maybe not the reason that we were seeing no benefit. Um, instead, it seems like maybe the resident AMF community was actually really doing quite well. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, we were talking already about how these different diversified methods of farming um, are really beneficial to the resident AMF community. And the um, it, it could well be that the cover cropping and crop rotations and um, other diversified farming techniques that all of these farms practice are actually establishing a really resilient microbial community 
And it doesn't really change anything or help anything to add an inoculant on, on top of that. Um, and in that, I also really want to emphasize that these results um, don't mean that AMF isn't helpful to these systems. It just means that these AMF additions don't add anything beyond what the resident community is already able to do for the system. So um, it sort of adds these management dimensions into if you are already managing in a way that allows you to have a resilient AMF community, maybe inoculating doesn't actually add much to the equation. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so looping back to those original results that we were looking at, um, though we were initially seeing a decrease in yields in the fully watered situations, you need to look more into that. And it seemed like um, we weren't seeing that at a broader scale on fully watered sort of conventionally um, managed processing tomatoes in the Central Valley. And then from the dry farming work, we're seeing that though it seemed like maybe there would be a benefit from these low water situations with AMF inoculation, digging more into that, it seems like that also is not a, a real um, slam dunk for why you might inoculate your crops. Um, and you can go to the final slide here. Oops. Um, so to sort of sum things up, um, we're not seeing conclusive evidence of a positive effect of AMF inoculation and in processing tomatoes. We're also not seeing any conclusive evidence of a positive effect of inoculation in fresh market tomatoes in these dry farm conditions. Um, we're also not seeing a negative effect of inoculation um, after digging more deeply into either. Um, and Tim, if you want to talk more about the tillage and cover cropping components, I can pass it back to you. Yeah. So just really briefly, this is just summing up what we talked about earlier, right? Um, as Yvonne said, it's our work on inoculation is really about that adding AMF didn't seem to make a difference on most of the farms. Because, and there's already this community that you can help steward um, in these ways, like if possible, reducing tillage, if, if your system allows for that, cover cropping. Um, and uh, even if you do have to do some tillage, cover cropping does seem to be an effective way to boost those populations. Um, but then also just having some caution um, around the types of amendments that you're adding, uh, particularly those with low into P ratios, right? This is a common issue in, um, in, in, in organic systems where we have phosphorus building up um, because a lot of composts and manures have pretty low into P ratios. So just something to pay attention to. Um, and then, um, yeah, I guess our final point is that if you are curious to experiment with AMF inoculation from a commercial using a commercial product, um, maybe try to start when your plants are might be stressed out because you are uh, reducing your water inputs, you're reducing your nutrients, um, some way that um, these mycorrhizae might really have a time to shine um, by by helping um, helping the plants out when they might be a little bit otherwise stressed. Um, so with that, we <laughs> definitely want to open it up for questions, um, discussion. Um, I'll keep the slides up just for a minute in case anybody has any just clarifying questions, but I'm really happy to, uh, I think Margaret is going to help us um, facilitate a little discussion. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, there have been a few questions, but they have somewhat been um, answered already in the chat. But uh, per your uh, comment you just made about um, adding mycorrhizal fungi, and maybe they're already established. One question was asking whether you can evaluate or test the presence of AMF in the soil uh, to get a baseline understanding. Um, the short answer is not really. Um, the types of things that we do to look um, at AMF um, involve um, you know, staining roots with some stuff, look at high powered microscopes, or um, there's also like DNA sequencing that can be done to look at who's there. But even if you know who's there in terms of like which AMF species, that doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information. I think in this case, it's like the main like piece of data that you can really use is just is trying an inoculant if you're interested. And if you see something, if you see healthier looking plants, higher yields, you might try it in conjunction with reducing inputs, then that's, I think, the, the best, um, the, you know, you don't see 
unlike other fungi, mycorrhizae don't form structures that we can see with our naked eye. They don't form mushrooms and you can't see their hyphae in the soil. They're too small. Lots of other fungi, of course you can, but, but these type are muscular mycorrhizal fungi, you can't, unfortunately. I will also just- So there was another, oh, go ahead. Sorry, jump in for a second to say that um, the AMF are ubiquitous in soils. So um, whether or not you can measure how much you have, I can guarantee you that there are AMF in any soil that you're trying to farm right now. And so it's more a question of how are you, or if you're able to um, foster a community that really is working for your farm as, a, as opposed to a presence versus absence question. Yeah, so that's a great point, Yvonne. Um, and following up, there's a question on thinking about the difference in the species that not, that are existing in your um, soil as opposed to those that are in the inoculum you're adding. Uh, can all AMS be cultured and made into inoculum? Is it possible that the inoculum you're adding doesn't reflect the community in the soil? I can answer that one. It's it's guaranteed that the there's many, or we know that there's many AMF species that cannot be cultured. And so yes, the inoculum, the AMF species that would be in the inoculum is very limited and not representative of what's out there. Um, and that also could affect the efficiency of the inoculums. Um, do we really know which AMF species are most functional and are those AMF species that are most functional, uh, is it possible to cultivate them and actually include an in inoculum? I think there's a lot of open, open and questions to that. Thank you. There's a question on um, whether you have any thought about the use of AMF on perennial crops like fruit trees and vineyards. I can at least say that um, I don't, we don't have any direct experience uh, working with uh, vines or um, trees, but they are um, uh, grapes and um, uh, orchard crops, um, citrus, and um, all the prunus, like uh, all the stone fruit and almonds and everything, they're all mycorrhizal uh, competent. Uh, they, they form associations specifically with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so they, they certainly have the, they might be, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any data um, on those specifically. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing here. Thanks, Tim. So uh, there was a question on whether um, N and P ratios could or should be used as a guide for AMS. Nina, do you want to take that? I feel like you've studied that the most this last summer. Um, I don't know specific NMP ratio, uh, I guess, based on what Tim has talked about. Uh, if the N to P ratio is too low, it may cause AMF to not really have a beneficial impact on plant yield. But yeah, I, I cannot say, cannot name a specific ratio that you should target for. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, I, yeah, I was, um, we have a couple other questions, but I was also, I just also, I put this in the chat, but if, if we have time, I'd love to hear from anybody if you have had any success using inoculants. Uh, I just thought it would be neat to hear from a, we had, I think four or five people who said they had used some, them successfully. Um, so just curious if anybody wanted to, to share um, just a little bit about their experience and share um, with others. 
<clears throat> Hello, um, I'll, I'll take a second to share a little bit here. Um, so the world of inoculants can actually be defined in, in several different ways. But um, so when I'm thinking inoculants, I'm thinking about um, things like uh, bio, uh, uh, compost teas or uh, bakashi and things like that. Anything that's uh, um, growing the microorganisms in your soil. So yes, I, I have um, for the last couple of years, I've been uh, playing with these resources and um, I find uh, one uh, using your local soil to start the process is good. Um, of course, I'm into the whole uh, worm compost uh, as well. So just um, giving life back to um, the soil through building the microorganisms and the fungi and so on. So um, myself, the ones in the bottle, um, it, to me, it's just like uh, as a beekeeper, if I get bees from California, they may last the season, but they don't like the area that I'm in, so they won't last. So with these kind of things, I think it's the same scenario. Um, as far as success, though, um, there were certain things that respond differently than others. Um, tomatoes done well, of course, brassicas are well. Some of the roots uh, particularly didn't, for some reason, like what the uh, blend and that I was doing at the time. Um, but I'm still uh, investigating and still working out some of these practices. Um, in our area, I'm in the Northwest. So I'm in the uh, Willamette Valley area. And um, there are some new, I'm gonna call it new theories out there um, with the concept of a soil food web. I don't know if that has run, if you've heard of that, you might check that out. That's uh, the professor from um, Oregon State University. Um, but anyway, since we're all here trying to figure out how to deal with the climate change and whatnot, um, I just wanted to touch in and, and add that little bit. Um, but it's definitely been seeing a difference in the soil, the water retention, and definitely uh, creating that, that mycelium. Yeah, thank you, Kwame. That was that was great. I mean, and I really appreciated your point about how something in a bottle may not really be representative of um, what's in your soil and what likes to thrive there. And I think, you know, that's definitely an issue in generally with these type of both AMF inoculants and generally with microbial inoculants that you might get from a salesperson at the, you know, uh, order online, that kind of thing is that they're going to have you know, the easily culturable organisms that may or may not really establish where you are. So I think it's something to try, play around with, but, you know, be cautious because like these things can cost a lot of money. Um, and uh, uh, you may have, like you were saying, the resources right there on your farm to, to kind of, you know, manage or steward those, um, those resident or indigenous microbes that are already there. Um, Thank you. Uh, Yvonne, there was a question about whether you sampled non-inoculated tomatoes for AMS. Yeah, we definitely did. So the comparison was between plots that were inoculated and plots that were not inoculated, and we did not find any difference in marketable yields between the inoculated and non-inoculated plots. And were you able to estimate the um, whether the AMF inoculation was a success after treating it? So I think there's different ways to quantify the success. So obviously in terms of yields, it was not successful. Um, whether or not the inoculant was sort of viable and actually you know, started colonizing plant roots um, is something that we're investigating this summer. We have DNA data, and so we're going to start looking into whether the species in the inoculum that we applied were actually enriched in the plant or in the microbial fungal communities in the inoculated plots. So that one is um, still TBD, but 
We'll report back when we know. Great, thank you. And there's a question about um, what the tillage system is in processing, processing tomatoes. Maybe paint a picture of what the sort of standard tillage was for these experiments. Yeah, Nina, do you want to do it or you want me? Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, this was across 20 different fields, so it's it's going to vary some, but I mean, in general, these are fairly intensively tilled systems, um, typically um, disked in the fall um, if there's no cover crop. Um, and then the beds are listed um, and prepared um, to fall prior uh, so that um, uh, planting can happen um, in the spring without without having to prepare the beds. Um, and of course, it's a little different if there's a cover crop um, in the ground that and, and bed preparation has to happen in the spring. Um, and the depth of tillage can vary, uh, I think, uh, some depending on um, on the soil. Um, but I don't think they're usually deep ripped um, where these systems are, but that might happen occasionally. Um, and then some cultivation um, for weed control and that kind of thing after after things are transplanted. So that's at least roughly. <laughs> roughly the tillage systems. Hey, thanks. And Tim also dropped a uh, evaluation in the chat. If folks wouldn't mind taking a couple minutes to complete that, that would be really wonderful. Um, there's another question about, and I'm not sure I understand it, but will inoculating tomatoes grown in tillage system help vis-a-vis no-till organic management? From Tushar Uttarwar. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's just asking whether um, it might be helpful in terms of AMF management to try no-till um, systems. And it's a hard question to answer because it's really hard to find no-till tomato farms. Um, it's especially organic organically grown tomatoes um, and for weed management and um, in the dry farm systems that I'm using for nutrient delivery, you wind up having some pretty intensively tilled fields. So I think that I, I would expect that it would likely help the, the AMF community to be in a no-till system, but I, I can't actually find the fields to go and sample to see whether or not that's true. Great, thanks. There was also just a recent question in the chat about um, what the species of AMS were that were used for the inoculations, and, and Tim answered that. And so has Yvonne. And we're more or less caught up. There's been other conversations about biochar and, and such that you can follow in the chat. But if folks have any more uh, questions or comments or insights to um, the the presenters here. You are. We still have a few more minutes. About five more minutes. I have a question. Um, I was curious if you guys had thoughts on how to inoculate or thinking about how to get uh, these fungi established on roots. Um, is there a difference in whether you do a root dip versus a soil drench or maybe other ideas? Yeah, so I can start and I'm curious to hear other thoughts on this and maybe from folks who have tried inoculation on their own farms, if you have experience with how you've inoculated and wanna chime in. Um, from talking with the, um, again, this is for commercial inoculants um, only. I want to make sure to narrow our focus to that because there's all sorts of other ways to, um, like Kwame was talking about, to increase the actual um, AMF community in your fields. But um, for these commercial inoculants, the company that we got our inoculant from basically told us that as long as the um, as long as you're getting the, the inoculum in the soil and um, sort of down to the rooting zone, that's all you really need to be concerned with. I think from um, 
my own perspective, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that you would want the spores to actually come into contact with the roots. So like a root dip where you know that you're actually actively dunking the root into the inoculum and you have that inoculum to root contact right from the get-go um, makes sense as opposed to, um, you know, if you spread it across the field and then till it in, um, it'll you're you're less guaranteed that you're actually going to have the inoculum where the roots are. Um, I know people have also delivered it through irrigation. You know, like you can do sort of like a, a fertigation kind of situation, but with inoculum instead of a fertilizer. Um, so yeah, I think the main the main issue is just how to make sure that you actually are getting those spores in contact with the roots, and there's different ways to go about getting them there. But curious to hear if anyone has any other experience. Yeah, and the only thing, other thing I would add is um, just keep in mind that these spores that would come are, are they're living and they might be relatively stable in this sort of like dry mix that they come in. Um, but once they are getting wet and in the soil, they're gonna start to, to basically germinate. Um, and if there aren't roots around for them to form associations with, they're gonna die. So. Um, you want to time it such that if you're adding these things, you want um, ideally to have living roots around already. So that's why either waiting until um, if you're direct seeding, waiting until things are up and germinating and maybe adding it to the drip line, or if you're transplanting, doing the dunk. Um, but if you add them too early and they don't have a root around, there's a good chance that the spores will kind of germinate, not find a host plant and then, and then perish, sadly. And one more thing that I'll also add to that is that we know that it takes probably at least eight or nine weeks for the AMF to sort of become established in a way that might start helping the plants. So um, you want to apply them early enough in the season that they actually have time to get going and provide benefit to the plants. Maybe to add, this is, this is if, if you use the inoculum um, that has spores. But yeah, Yvonne made it clear at the beginning that we're talking about inoculation specifically here. Great, and Thomas added a comment about how he adds them. Uh, you can see that in the chat. Um, well, it's, it's 5.15. Um, is Evan still on the line? I'm still here. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, this has been very enlightening. I'm glad we were able to dig a little deeper into this topic. Uh, and it sounds like it's, uh, it's a complex one. So um, if uh, folks have more questions, if they're interested in, in learning more about this, uh, we can uh, send them to you with all their additional follow-up questions, I'm sure. Um, but otherwise, I think uh, these will be a topic that, that we at the Small Farm Conference and at uh, CAF Community Alliance of Family Farmers will be uh, picking up again and again. Um, so uh, stay tuned for more. Uh, we've got two more days of the conference left with lots more uh, workshops ahead. So uh, hope to see it, some of those. You might even see a couple of these folks uh, in those workshops. So um, stick around. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good, 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 good.